too high of evaluation means that VCs, on their own hand, will not get as much returns. So like, oh, okay, we cannot afford the valuation of this business. Everybody start up is special. You are building the next thing, you are building something very global. But when they ask you, what's your valuation? You probably want to say $100 million, $500 million. Startups in your sectors, what are their valuation like? Look at it closely and try to find a sweet middle point. What is your growth trajectory like? How have you been able to grow every month? Ideally, 30 to 40 percent. If we are seeing 50 percent month on month growth, trust me, this is the one that will be reaching out to you. Fundraising is like dating. You are in a better position to raise funding when it seems like you don't really need it. We are at a constitution before where it seems like when you are not interested in dating people that they are not, they, they start rushing you for no reason. It's almost the same thing with. This is funny. When, when you hear things like, oh, you are seeing a business that is attractive, it's good, this is too. And you're telling them, we're not looking to raise right now. If I tell you that, <laughs> more people, like more VCs, they will be interested in that business even a lot more. Sometimes your market is not big enough for VC money. And that's the truth. My name is Tamara Fusibi. I am Chief Consultant at ITOS Business. We are a startup advisory firm. We've worked with startups in about four continents, really, to help them create things like a fundraising strategy, work with them on their documents, just basically present them, help them present themselves better to investors. Also, I am community director at Unicorn Founders Africa. So we are a network of founders, investors, and operators in the tech ecosystem. We've been operational for the past five years, and one of my goals as community director is really to nurture and support the next generation of founders from Africa. Right, so that's just a quick introduction about myself. Um, so just let's go to, okay, the next slide. All right, so I mean, I think there's one before this. You skipped. Yeah, so I mean, I think we're a, a lot of us, I mean, early stage, I, I believe, yes, you're most of, mostly early stage startups in this room, or maybe you haven't um, started the entire process, maybe you are building something. Um, so there are basically a lot of financing types, but the most financing types that we have, like quite popular um, with us is really equity and debt. Um, most early stage startups go for equity. Debt can be, you know, typically when you've maybe raised before you're looking to expand or looking to grow, um, then you can pick on debt. So then just next um, slide. So really, my goal um, here this evening is not just to just give you a lot of information, but just to help you really think through how to create a strategy for your startup, really. So you see that I'm hoping you take notes. Um, I like my classes interactive, so I may just call, some, call a few people and ask you, you tell me, okay, from what I've shared, how you're going to position your startup better, really. So just a quick um, introduction to VC math. I call it quick VC math. Know this so you can position yourself well. V series fund two, right? So you are looking to, I mean, of, of course, looking to raise maybe venture debt for equity and things like that. But understand that VCs also raised money, right? So they raised money from institutional investors, family offices. Probably maybe they said, oh, we've, we've gone, they've gone with their own interesting pitch that, oh, I mean, we're looking, the um, Africa startup ecosystem is burgeoning, is good. Give us money, we will invest in these startups and give you so and so returns. So understand that from your own point of view that, look, these VCs you are raising money from, they also raised money. So understand that and have that at the back of your mind. Secondly, because they have raised money, right, and they also have to deliver returns as well. So you are looking to also, you also have to deliver returns to them. So most VCs are also looking for 100x. I said 100x. I said that and that's true. That's the real truth that you need to understand. Um, because they also have to exit, they also have to return that money to family offices, because most times they are also raising rounds as well, so probably will raise the first round, they've invested it in a pool of startups, you know, looking for the one that would give them that 100 returns, and they can pay back that money to raise their second round, right? So they also have those rounds as well, they're also looking to exit as well. So this is why it seems like some sectors are prioritized more, because how many startups in there? How many sectors in Nigeria can realistically give you 100 times your money back? Think about it. How many? Everyone is silent. <laughs> exactly. So, you can see why some sectors seem to be prioritized more when it comes to VC money. So, this is why. All right, so next slide, please. 
Okay, so simple things. I mean, what are venture funds really looking for? And I'm sharing this because I also, myself, I VC scouts as well. Um, because also, because of my work with Unicorn Founders Africa and Founders, I have VCs come to reach out to me. Please do have decks and so and so for so and so sectors. So I also know what they're looking for, right? And also, I would also reach through VC um, CZs. So one thing again you should also know is that, I mean, especially for, I mean, we're going to go into it during this um, presentation, but also know that VCs too also have their own thesis, right? So also they know, they, they are clear what they're looking for, most of them. Right, so I'll look at that. I will ju I'll just share quick, quick things on you know a lot of things that they're looking for. Most are looking for. It's not set in stone. Two VCs are not the same, right? The same way two startups will not be the same. But majority of time, this is what they're looking for. Number one, decent valuations. Right, so they want to come in early. They want to, I mean, a well-priced business. Maybe they probably maybe raise about maybe twenty million dollars, thirty million dollars. They're looking maybe maybe drop at least maybe. I'm just I'm just giving you like I'm just I'm I'm just using like average numbers here. Maybe they're trying to drop hundred thousand dollars in about maybe five startups, maybe just for the first round, right? As you're looking for well-priced businesses, right? So decent valuations. That's kind of startups they're looking for. So too high because I know everybody's startup is special, right? Your startup is special. You are building the next thing. You are building something very global, and that's it. But so you want to, when they ask you, what's your valuation? You probably want to say $100 million, $500 million, right? But too high of evaluation means that VCs, on their own hand, will not get as much returns. So like, oh, okay, we cannot afford the valuation of this business. And they might look down, I might like, turn away and look somewhere else, right? Meanwhile, too low means you will shoot your own self in the foot because you are also building something and you have to believe in what you are building, right? And, you know, this now becomes the next big thing, but you don't even own a lot of it because you've reduced your valuation is just way too low, right? So you just have to find a very sweet middle point. And one thing I, I like to do with a lot of um, setups I work with is I, I teach them, especially founders, I teach them, try and do something called benchmarking, right? Setups in your sectors, what are their valuation like? Look at it closely and try to find a sweet middle point, right? But I'll still go ahead and maybe I'll tell you, like, a bit about valuations, maybe later, but I'm just telling you for, for now, that's, this, uh, that's something that they're looking for decent valuation. Secondly, solid founding team, right? At least have domain expertise, know what you are building, know the sector you are building in and out, right? So you're building something in travel. Have you traveled? Do you know what's, what's the process like for Nigerians traveling? Do you understand? Know that business in, in and out, know have people that also have that domain expertise. And I also want to tell you something, like I said earlier, basically with my work with VCs, preferably if you can. I'm not saying that you can't, but if you can, try to have more than one founder. It's less risky for a VC, right? A solo founder, it's not saying, I'm not saying it's bad, but it's less risky. So if you can, try to find more than one. Let have more than one founder. Preferably have a technical co-founder, right? So that person probably understands the tech side of the business. You know, you, you, it can be you, right? But make sure that you just have that expertise on your team is very important. Third one is month-on-month -month growth, right? So we're not expecting that you can make all the money immediately. We understand that you're also a business, you're growing, you're just starting out, right? But what is your growth trajectory like? Every month, how have you been able to improve? So ideally, like personally, I'm, I, I'm also looking at, I mean, if I'm looking at startups, I'm still looking at your numbers, right? How have you been able to grow every month? Ideally, 30 to 40%. If, if, if we are seeing 50% month on month growth, trust me, this is the one that will be reaching out to you. Right? Not set in stone, but at least there's decent growth. Every month you are growing. Track those numbers. Make sure as a, as a founder, you're also tracking those numbers. Right? So that's another thing they're looking for. Last thing, but not the least. Remember, I said earlier that they also raised money. Right? So there must be a clear path to exit. As a founder, you started this, you started your idea, you're working on the idea, the idea is great, you're passionate about it, but okay, what is your route to exit? If you're getting, if you're going to work maybe by yourself, funding by yourself, I mean, that's what, they have really great startups that are making insane amount of money. They have never raised any single form of venture debt, right? They're not looking to exit. They don't care about that. They might even exit maybe later, but they don't have to return any money to anybody because they funded themselves. Right? Maybe those, those kind of guys, maybe they are also maybe second time founders and all of that. But you, if you're looking to raise venture debts, 
you have to have a clear path to exit. That clear path is very important. And communicate that as well, right? Be either through maybe secondary sale, because they also have, like I said, mentioned earlier, they also have, the, also have to make their own money. So either through maybe secondary sales, IPOs, acquisitions, and things like that, right? It's very important. That's a very, very important point, I must tell you, right? If everything still sounds woozy, or maybe it just sounds like I'm speaking Greek, try and go to startup school. Use, um, go on YC startup school, and just go and study all of, all of these terms. As a founder, it's very important. It's good to know them. So next slide, please. Fundraising is like dating. Crafting a fundraiser, I mean, I'm here to really show you how to craft a fundraising strategy for your startup. I'm gonna tell you one thing. Fundraising is like what? Dating. Number one, position. The real truth of the matter is, you are in a better position to raise funding when it seems like you don't really need it. Have you ever seen that kind of, have you had a conversation before where it seems like it's when you are not interested in dating people that they, are not, they, they start rushing you for no reason? It's almost the same thing with VC funding. When, when you hear things like, oh, you are seeing a business that is attractive, it's good, this is too. And you're telling them, we're not looking to raise right now. If I tell you that, <laughs> more people, like more VCs, they will be interested in that business even a lot more. Unfortunately, that's the truth of the matter. It's when you are desperately looking for funds, it's as if something about something about you will be chasing them away. <laughs> One is almost just like you don't really, we're not really looking to raise right now. And that's why you see that almost as if they'll be all over you. Attract. So the best startups have VCs looking to get in early. Like I mentioned earlier, if you're able to put a few parameters in place, at least you'll be well positioned, right? To get that funding. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna go at, so I'm gonna go here because one major reason. Um, one major thing you have to do as, as a founder, really, and I know that it's not also, also I'm going to just, just going to say, say it. It's not going to be so easy for people that are not very extroverted, but you need to have a visibility strategy. You really need to be visible, right? So I'm going to go to the next slide now, please. So visibility is your strategy as an early stage startup. You don't have money yet. I mean, you're still really to raise money. Maybe you've gotten a few customers, you're still, uh, you know, I mean, you're still getting into it, but that visibility is really one of your key strategies, right? So number one, craft a solid brand strategy. I cannot tell you the amount of pitch decks I have seen that they probably have maybe 50, 20, 30 slides. 30 slides isn't too much for goodness sake. But 20 slides, and I don't understand what they do exactly. I've just been seeing disrupt, 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 disrupt on their Start up, um, not their pitch deck, but I don't know what they are doing. I don't really know. So it's very important for you to craft a solid brand strategy. Let what you do be clear. At least, people say five year old, at least let it, if you explain what you are doing to a 10 year old, let the person to understand what you are doing. Let it be clear. The simpler, the better, no honesty. Try to stay away from buzzwords. Banking the unbanked. I'm tired. I, I, if I sit down on the pitch deck, I'm like, okay, thank you. But I'm not interested. Clear and defined well, I'm clear and well defined brand guide. So, I mean, work with people, just have that really clear and have that messaging be clear everywhere, right? Those are just simple things. It seems like it's simple. It seems like, well, I'm, I'm building the, the next big thing in this world. Yeah, but these little things matter, right? So, those things there. Then, starting out, like I said earlier, you're looking to raise money and everything. Sometimes it's your personal brand that will carry that startup. What did I say? Sometimes it's your personal brand, right? And that's why I mentioned earlier that it may not always be easy for people that are introverted, but you can try. You can make the effort. There's a reason why a lot of founders post on Twitter. They're always talking. They seem, they seem very popular because they're talking on Twitter, right? You might think that ah, these people are just so noisy, but it's a strategy. If I, want, if, I want, if I want to invest, maybe I'm looking for so-and-so sectors, to invest in. I know this founder that is always talking about, okay, oh yes, history has a startup. I might likely go and ask for his speech deck. That's someone I don't know from anywhere. Right? So that's just an effort for you to be visible. Social media, talk as, talk as much as possible. Talk about what you do. Pitch, I know like, it can take a lot of, um, it takes a lot of guts sometimes to come and walk, talk in front of people and tell them, okay, this is what you do and everything. But let me tell you something, that's how founder, you have to be ready. At any time, someone is telling you, okay, oh, what do you do? Say it. Don't be nervous. There are pitch events like this. I've, I've seen 
pitch events like this when people have raised their first 100K. It's first 20, 20K, right? From just pitching. So don't be nervous. Get, get rid of the, those nerves and really work on it, right? Be used to speaking engagements. Take them on. Um, so like a, you might not have, as an early stage founder, you may not have so much for, because like I said, you are raising money, right? You may not have so much for marketing. But just try to be creative around it. Things like speaking engagements. Take them. Things like doing Twitter spaces often. Like be consistent with those Twitter spaces. Talking about, okay, maybe, maybe, maybe if you are in healthcare now, talking about more issues or more things about health. Just those little things that make you visible, right? So that people can see. Because, okay, now on Twitter now, do venture scouts you're looking for also on that, on that Twitter, right? So try and be visible as much as you can, right? So like I mentioned earlier, lots of platforms to promote your, promote your startups. Take advantage of all of those things and do them. Some people sponsor events. It's not really because of they are passionate about what the person is doing, but they know that their target audience will be there, customers will be there, and also likely investors will be there. So, and they sponsor, right? So I'm just giving you ideas and tips that you can really use to push on yourself. But that visibility is very important. Like I showed earlier, fundraising is a lot like dating, right? So here's why you're not getting a text back. Here's why your emails are going unreplied. Here's why people are like, oh, okay, thank you, get back to you, but they're not really getting back to you. Number one, overvaluation. Like I mentioned earlier, sometimes your valuation is just really way out of um, the reach of the VC, right? They didn't know, okay, the valuation is your industry, this is how it is. And I told them earlier, they also have to make their own returns, right? And it may just be overvalued, they're like, oh, no, not for this one, let's, let's go to other, other guys. Secondly, and most important, really, market size. This is something that a lot of um, founders tend to ignore, but I can tell you that this is incredible. If you don't take anything from what I've shared today, please take this market size seriously. Sometimes your market is not big enough for VC money, and that's the truth. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes the solution you are looking to build is not big enough for that VC money. Right, and you can also see why, I hope from what I'm sharing, I see why it seems like a lot of, some sectors are prioritized a lot more than others when it comes to funding. This is why. Sometimes your market size is not big enough. It gives an example, so sometimes you are running a profitable SaaS. Sometimes you are making more new. But just to get venture capitals, capitalists to invest in is hard. This is why. Sometimes your market size is not, your market just not big enough for VC money. You also have to make that 100x returns. Right, and maybe your market is just not big enough. Number three, sector mix match. As a founder, before you even start pitching to investors and all of that, be very clear that they are also investing in your, your sectors. So that you're sending several emails to VCs that are not investing, maybe, maybe you're in healthcare, sending several in, um, emails in, to VCs that are investing only in fintechs. How are they going to get back to you? They'll just be polite. Most, a lot of them will be polite. Some of them might not, might not even reply. A lot of them will be polite. But they're not investing in your sector. So do that research. It's very important. Right? Check if they actively invest in your sector. Study their thesis. I shared about thesis earlier. A lot of VCs, they have thesis. So thesis to just show you okay, who they are, what they're investing in, what kind of things they're passionate about. You know, study those things. In fact, what is even great if you can study those things and maybe if you're pitching them, Say, they are, say, they are, say the key words you find in those theses. Say it back to them. Shows interest. Last thing, it may just not be you. We've, we've tried to raise um, for a, um, a startup before, and I know that these, these guys, they would actually put in money into this deck, but like, oh, we're sorry. We are currently raising funds in-house right now. Maybe we can't get back to you now. Maybe, maybe so and so a couple of months we will. So my budget may just not be you. They may have like their own internal issues. So don't always take it personally. In fact, if you are fundraising, be prepared for a lot of things. Number one, prepared, that, prepared for the fact that it may take longer than you, you, you planned. Maybe you think that, oh, if you try and reach out, no, it may take longer. I know some founders have been trying to raise for the past 18 months. Right, they are good businesses though. Popular, they are quite popular. But they've been trying to raise for the past 18 months. And it's not, it's, it's not there's nothing there, but just they're still getting so many no's. So sometimes you get a lot of no's before you get that yes. But you just have to keep pushing. You just have to be used to rejection, right? Don't take it personally. 
move on to the next. Okay, so I'm almost rounding off. Um, so I wanted to quickly include this slide because uh, a lot of times you just don't know. We're doing some things you just don't really know that we're doing them, right? So I think we skipped, we skipped something, did we not? We skipped a slide. We haven't. Okay, all right. I'll just, I guess I will just bring that in. So, I mean, pitch deck, memo pointers, really. And also, another thing, again, I will also share is, as a founder, please, and you get to even fundraise, have your documents ready. I've had, I mean, I've had con interesting conversations with founders before, and okay, I know that this is what they do, right? And an opportunity pops up. They're like, oh, we're scouting for so-and-so um, startup in this sector. Right? And I can't quickly reach out to the founder. The founder does not have a pitch deck. <sighs> I'm like, okay, what do I do? How, I mean, how, what, what are we going to do? And, uh, and like I said, something you need to understand about VC sometimes is they're not, you're not the only startup they're looking at in that sector. They're looking to invest in so and so sector, right? So be prepared to know they're probably looking at 10 to 20. And I think again, you should also know this. Sometimes they have maybe five, six minutes to look at your deck to see if it's interesting. You see if this is something that they're interested in before they move on to the next. So always have that at the back of your mind, even when you're preparing your own documents. Right? So your pitch decks, financial memos, um, investment memos, excuse me, financial models, have those things on hand, have those things ready. Be updating them as regularly as possible. That's why I, I always appreciate founders that take time to pitch in you know, startups. Because your, even your pitch deck alone will not always remain the same. You will always be updating it. Right? So things like that. So just quickly... Quick things, pitch deck, memo points. Like I mentioned earlier, they'll have probably maybe five, an average VC have maybe five, six minutes to look at your pitch deck, see if something is worthwhile before they're moving on. For, before you can get maybe a yes or maybe, or maybe a no, right? So simple things, simplify. Like I mentioned earlier, let your messaging be clear. Clear design, good brand guide, you know. People are, people are busy. We're looking at maybe 10 to 20 in, in, in the sector. So just imagine that, okay, at the back of your mind, okay, we, this person has maybe five minutes to look at my pitch deck. How can I make this what they are while? Well, well, how can I make it okay, say, okay, yes, maybe I should actually, you know, make this interesting. So have that at the back of your mind. Secondly, track record. A lot of people don't um, talk about this a lot. So, I mean, especially if you're early stage, you don't really always have all the numbers, right? Like I mentioned earlier, you're growing month on month, right? But you, sometimes you don't always have all the very huge numbers yet, right? But you have small wins. Document those wins. Talk about them lavishly. Put them out. Don't hide them. Don't keep them somewhere. You're looking to raise funds. Everything that will make you as visible as possible and as attractive as possible, share it. Valuation. Like I mentioned earlier, well, valuation is not really exactly favorable to the early stage startup. When you hear things like that, people, and sometimes, sometimes from founders get defensive, like, oh, you're trying to price me low. You're trying to look down on my business. It's not exactly that. It means, okay, I need to give you money but your business is too priced too high for me to be able to afford you. So I'll just politely move on to the next one I can afford. So try to keep your valuation as a decent um, pace, right? I even always even advise founders, especially with this valuation. Personally, personally, this is also, also a personal preference, right? I try not to, I ask my founders not to really add that valuation to the deck yet. Unless maybe you're asked by the VC. I try not to because... You know, I don't want the case where I'm looking because I've had we've had meetings with VCs. I'm like, ah, they don't saw valuation. I said, ah, two million dollars valuation. Okay, maybe next, next one, right? But I mean, if you if you just maybe not mentioned it at all there for now, maybe they come. They, maybe it's when they have the meetings with you or quickly have calls and they can ask you. They cannot have that conversation, right? So just for it's just the same thing. Like maybe when you're doing your CV and there's some mention, this you don't mention yet. Let them ask you first, right? So same, same, same mindset. So that's our pitch, pitch deck memo pointers. So at this point, I'm going to ask. I'm going to ask if anyone. Okay, I'm going to ask one or two people. Just share maybe what something you learned before we take any questions. Something you learned. So I'll pick so anyone at random. Raise your hand. The guy in green. Tell me something. Yeah. So I learned about dating. <laughs> <laughs> I 
<laughs> but yeah, um, I think the um, valuation, never overvalue yourself is, um, is a very key thing that um, is very important. Most um, founders think that, the, the thought is that, oh, if I'm able to get a higher valuation, I'm able to move faster. But then I, I learned about valuation. Never overvalue your startup. Thank you very much. We're not saying, we're not saying don't price it too low. We're just keeping it as a sweet point, right? So, yeah. Thank you for sharing. All right, I think from this um, deck, I think um, it brings home for me the track record because um, I think on the WhatsApp group, someone was talking about traction and this really bring, the track record brings it home and that's what I'm trying to work on. So this like set it down for me. Thank you. Great, thank you. Okay, the third person. Um, so I basically got to understand that the odds are more in favor of companies that already have like revenue and traction as opposed exactly. to like pre-idea or pre-launch companies, which is not a very good thing. Well, it's not, but yeah. at the end of the day, it's, you know, this is also taking a risk on you, a chance on you, yeah. right? So what about, what about the companies whose ideas require funding before they can be brought to life? There's always a small MVP you can do. That's something I always say. There's always a small MVP you can do, even if it's a Google Doc sheet, mm -hmm. right? Be creative. Fair enough. Okay. So, I mean, I think now it's, uh, we'll take questions now, right? Since everyone has shared what they what All they right. Planned. So, we can take questions. Um, I hope you don't mind me sitting down for this, please. Hi. Um, and uh, my name is Yenka Johnson. I'm a founder of um, a health tech e-commerce platform. Thanks for your presentation, actually. Um, it's... Um, it's made me think through some other things. So my questions are two. The first is, you know, about valuation. You know, you talked about, actually, I was even watching something, and I watched this um, elevator pitch thing by entrepreneur, and they always talk about valuation, you know. Exactly how is the valuation actually calculated? You know, maybe you can give some practical, you know, in terms of numbers, you know, how is it actually valued? You know, here, a startup come there, $10 million valued and all that. And then the second question is about e-commerce. E because we are, we are building an e-commerce platform, health tech, a niche area, right? And then, you know, you talked about, you know, how um, um, there are some, depends on the size of the market, you know, the addressable market. From the experience you've had, you know, what prospects do you think an e-commerce platform has going forward? Because I know you'd have seen a lot of, like you said, you've seen a lot of big decks and stuff like that. You've seen, you've worked with quite a number of, um, you know. So, so those are my two questions. Thanks. Thank you. So for the second question, almost every class I ask, people always ask me, what are the prospects of my idea? <laughs> so what I, what I would say about... Um, but you can always, you can always take. Um, I'm just saying this from a qualitative point of view, right? You can always take on what if EC may say. If EC may be wrong about what your startup is, how good your startup is going to get, or they may be right. You are the one that has to take that chance on yourself, right? But one thing I like to do is I like to do a forecast of the future. I take a look at okay the current market and current market trends, right? And how is what I'm doing in line. How can this, how can this impact the future, right? And I make, I make an adjust tweak sometimes. That's really, that's really my own personal strategy, right? So because someone, you, you, can't, you can't always say, okay, someone tells you, oh, this idea will be viable, not be viable. You can never know until you take a chance on it, right? But you can always look at market trends, even if it's ever changing and, and fast and changes fast, and say, okay, good. So how can this idea, change. Let me give an instance now. So I've run an advisory for the past six years, right? And basically, we've just been doing a lot of, um, you know, working one-on-ones -on with founders. And I said, I would say, okay, you know what? At this point, I need, we need to disrupt ourselves before the world disrupts us. And that thought really led to my team sitting down to make a lot of, t we, we built tech products, we built, a, we built products with AI. So the, so the things that we do one-on-ones with founders, we use AI to, to, to change and disrupt it. 
Right? Because I was, I was like, okay, you know what? These are market trends. And how can I stay ahead? Right? So just have that at the back of your mind whenever you have, okay, I have an idea. Okay, how can my, my idea be viable or things like that? Just, just think, current market trends. How can I stay ahead? Right? So for the first um, question about valuation, this is also another question I get a lot. Um, so because you are still early stage, you are still idea, sometimes it may still be idea stage, you can't always have a set valuation. But something I always like to do is do what we call benchmarking. Look at startups in your sectors. How are they valued on average? Right? These are sectors, startups that have already had um, a form of track record already. Right? They have traction and all that. How are they valued already? And try to use that to adjust and tweak your own as, an, as a new entrant. So it just makes it easy. Do you understand? Does that help? Okay. It's my pleasure. Okay. I think I see a hand up here. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. My, my name is Bolaji. The other time you mentioned about your pitch deck, that we should always have our pitch deck. You know, you now said a company was asking about pitch deck. They don't have their pitch deck. Is it, that, is it a kind of a physical pitch deck or virtual pitch deck? Or what do you advise? I mean, a lot, a lot, of, work, a lot of work now is done online. Okay. It's, and I, I, I will tell you some, for a fact, I get more pitch decks on WhatsApp than even email. Okay. Right? So just have that ready. Adjust it, change whenever you have wins, whenever you've had new change, whenever you see your new numbers. Adjust it, always. Thank you. Right? Stay on top. Thank you. Great. You mentioned documents. Um, apart from the pitch deck, what about what about, uh, other important documents do funders need to acquire or get ready? Like the top part of them that funder needs to have ready, just in case of an emergency pitch or emergency. Right. Th thanks for sharing that because there was supposed to be a slide there, but for some reason I, that was omitted. Um, so before you start even writing on anything, right? Um, just have at the back of your mind, just a thought, right? That I need to share what I do. Mm -hmm. And I need to convince people on the other side to give me money. So what are the things I will need? Just have that in the back of your mind first. So the first thing, typically a pitch deck, which is like a visual realization of your business, you're convincing people. Another, another one I, which I also personally like, I even prefer to pitch decks, are investment memos. Investment memos, they are sometimes in doc form, you know, it's, it's like a more detailed representation, right, of your business, I prefer that. And that thing is good. It also is a financial model. Um, at least you, as, you're, as you are growing, as you are growing, you need to know your numbers. You need to be able to document those numbers, right? So, I mean, put that in the financial model. It's a basic one to have. It just makes it easy. So, whenever um, investors asking you questions, you have those things there to, to share, right? Last one, I mean, I don't, not all early stage founders need this, but it also depends on the kind of investor you are reaching out to and also the stage of your business. A business plan as well. As well. So those are just basically um, major, majorly the four. There are other ones, but majorly those four. You can start with one and grow as, you know, work your way up. Right. Okay. Uh, my name is Oladaya. Uh, I just wanted to understand, I mean, for your consultancy business, uh, if one wanted to reach out to you, uh, how do we go about doing that? And um, are you going to share your rates here? Is there sure. any discount for any of this event? <laughs> Something like that. Thank you. Thank you. So, I mean, the last slide, thanks. Um, that's my email. Always shoot me an email. Um, it's pretty easy to. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to give you out the top of my head, but just, just, just share that you're in one of my classes and we'll see what we can do. Hello. Hello. Yeah. All right. Okay, yeah, my name is uh, Moses. You talked about um, 100 times exit or so. So, for how long? Is it for a year or just? <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me ask you a question. How many businesses, who, who has this idea? How many companies or startups have exited in Nigeria? How many? What? Yeah, acquired. IPO. You know, you know, you know, tax acquisition did so good for our ecosystem. A lot of the times when 2021, 2022, when you're seeing a lot of capital coming in, it was tax that was the one of the catalysts to that. 
right? So yeah. So how many years? People are still looking for that 100 exit as, it, as we speak. A lot of startups are still looking for that 100 exit. But just have that at the back of your mind. All right, thank you. Um, Tony, um, founder of Ibigi, we are literally a escrow service. So we're look yes, an escrow service. So we're looking to make life easier and give peace of mind to buyers and sellers online. So first question is, you mentioned a financial memo. Is that the same thing as a financial projection document? Sorry, so um, a financial model. Okay, financial right. model. So think about financial model as present, financial projections as future. So your numbers just that works. Easy. Okay. Aside that, one more question is more bias. Yes. So we are a we are about four founders, right? And we've been self-funding, and we'll be launching in September. So for a business like this that is in the fintech ecosystem and would likely to have a high valuation, how do you advise we go about to reach out to VCs to ensure funding? Yes. I mean, you already have a list. Already, you know VCs already have them. So reach out. Try and find out. One, one quick tip I'll just give you. Um, when you also when it comes to reaching out to people. This has also really helped me pitch to people. I know I mentioned earlier that I have a founder community. Right? Um, and I, we have some of the most interesting people in that community. We have people like Piggy Vest, Rise Vest, and things like that. Right? I used LinkedIn. LinkedIn was good. So you might not want to go, maybe if you're looking to maybe even pitch, you might not want to go directly maybe to the founder of the VC firm, or the principal and the general partner, right? Try the VC scouts. Try it. Try them. Pitch. VC scouts. Yeah, try. Try and reach out to those guys first. You know, those are the guys, if, if I'll be very honest, those are the guys doing the law of the needle work. So try and pitch first. Right? And see. Yeah. All right, any other questions? You guys here, yeah, you don't have startups that you want to raise for. That's sad. Any other question, please? All right. Hi, Tamara. Hello. Hi. We met on LinkedIn. My name is Queen Esohe. Okay. Hi. Yeah. Um, so my question really is about... So I'm speaking as an investor, right? Um, investors want to get the lowest possible valuation. <laughs> And as I went out hearing him say that, you know, a bootstrap or pre revenue will want to have the highest possible valuation. I'm like, we're clearly I heard at that odds. too. <laughs> we're clearly, clearly at odds, right? Um, so my real question is, how I'm investors, I'm always looking for the cheapest possible equity. And I want, obviously, I want push revenue if I can have it, right? That's, you're most likely to succeed, right? Um, how, how do we bridge that funding gap? Um, because I'm looking for the best of the best in the economy that inflation is as crazy as it is. Here's looking for the most equity and patient capital. <laughs> uh, how, 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 how exactly, because I need to invest in the guy so that, you know, I can get returns back to my office. He needs money so he doesn't die because he's most likely to die within three years. So yeah. how does it make sure it doesn't become a statistic? Um, how do we, how do we, how does that gap, how do we, how, how do we bring that gap? I don't know how to explain what I'm saying. Okay, so, How okay. do we close that gap? Thank you. Okay, so first of all, I would say as an investor, we're all feeling it. Like looking to, <laughs> raise in this economy, um, looking to get our returns in the economy, things are slightly, unfortunately, getting worse. Purchasing power is declining. It's not easy. Um, so basically, I'll just maybe share efforts that also investors can also do. Things like knowledge sharing for founders. A lot of them don't know. People just say, oh, I want the highest possible valuation of my business and things. And we're like, okay, things don't really always work like that. Right? So things like looking to bridge that gap is communi that communication. Try and have it clear. Right? So invest in people like, you know, sponsor people like income founder events so that we can have and share more knowledge with founders, things like that. So just bring that gap in communication, really. Because like I said, a lot of founders don't know. A lot of, a lot of people are just hearing for the first time today that that affordable valuation is, you know, is why they've not been getting their text back. Right. So I think it's going to be a communication. Thing. Sorry. Um, follow up, really. Um, it's part of my assignment, but I need to know that. Um, is there 
as an investor, an ecosystem leader like you are, um, what are the tangible reasons why we don't have a lot of female founders funded? So is it that we don't have enough female founders or their startups are not venture backable or we don't like female founders? Really? Or, or there's just an inherent bias that if you're a female founder, you're likely to fail. So I'd rather give the money to a guy. So I'm not, I don't want, I'm asking, I, I don't want something that, I don't want a flimsy, I don't want a, you know, feeling, I feel that, <laughs> like, I, I, I just want to know if there are real reasons why if you have 10 men and two women that are equally as good, the women are most likely not to get that money. Are there key things that are not, that are not a, so is it, is it no gender bias, really? Right. Okay, so. Um, to be honest, I'll ask, ask about the questions that I'm um, shared today. This may be the most um, challenging one um, because that question also worries me a lot. We are having less founders. I remember when we were starting um, Ingo Founders three years ago. To get founders, female founders, even in the community, was so hard because we just could not find them. Right. Um, but I'm just going to share more what, you know, what can be done, really. I think that's from that point because asking why may not always be the... Um, the best way to go about it. Representation matters, you know. So things like being deliberate about supporting female founders. And something else also I need to share um, with founders here is that in this thesis, we have a lot of them prioritizing diversity and inclusion, right, in their thesis. That means that if you are a team of only four guys, they may be like, oh, this doesn't fit our thesis. No female founder there. So have that, not that. Right, so when you're also pitching as well. I've had, I've had um, there's, there's a, there was a startup we we're trying to coach, really. And the reason why this particular VC did not put a check in them, they were like, oh, thank you. I mean, you great business, good price point. But I mean, it's all male founders. It doesn't fit our thesis of diversity and inclusion, right? So things like that. So just note that. So I'm just going to prioritize, we'll share what um, the kind of things that we're doing. So things like working on actively, you know, engaging female founders creating support, financing for female founders. And something I must say personally uh, is I, sometimes I get tired of women just being advised. Give us money. Fund female, actually fund female founders. Make the effort. This same thing will also be, you know, this, you know like I said, mentioned earlier, this can be a very challenging question because even race to the same thing. If you go to a, a particular room and there are 10, um, 10, 10 white male founders and two uh, black male founders, the black male founders are going to be the least prioritized, unfortunately, right? So, like I said, it's, it's very challenging. There are too many markers and pointers, but let's focus on what we can do, right? Which is actively prioritize investing in female founders. So, can Thank I you. add a question to that? <laughs> okay. How do you ensure that um, the female founders who are added to these teams for diversity do not just become tokens? Look, there are good people out there. There are competent female people out there. It's not, I mean, competence is not gender. Um, yeah, yeah, but, so, the reason I ask is, I've seen too many, okay, so, I, I've spoken to a few founders who are raising money, all male teams, and because of this, they are now actively looking for a female founder. Actually, they didn't need an extra founder, but because they, they were getting this feedback from VCs, we need a more diverse team, they decided to, uh, to look for a woman and in their immediate networks, they couldn't find one. So the problem now became, where do we find these, these women? So how do you ensure that they, they don't just get one woman out there just so that they meet a criteria? Okay, so, I mean, let's, not, let's also be very careful not to delve into tokenism, right? Just give us a oh, just female founders. But I would tell you that there are still competent people around. Even in those teams, there's a competent lady doing something and moving the needle somewhere. There just needs a little push, a little coaching to rise up to that level, and they should give you the result that you're looking for, right? So don't, don't deprioritize prioritize them. If you, if you look for them, you will find, even within your current circle. Okay, um, any other questions? Okay. Yeah. Hi, I'm Tamara. Um, nice presentation. Uh, I just wanted to ask some things, like I know most founders are fundraising, I've had the opportunity to um, work with a lot of founders at my previous employment also. Uh, I just want to ask, what do you think are some of the red flags founders should watch out for? 
because uh, not everyone throwing those check at you really means good. So what are some of those things you can really watch out for while fundraising? I'd like to get your view on that. Okay, thanks. That's a very important question because as a founder, you also, you have the responsibility to be very careful about the kind of capital you take. There's a lot of money, money laundering schemes out there. They are discovered and it's pointing back to you that that money came to you. You also have to be careful, right? So, do your own due diligence as well, right? Do not accept any money. It's very important as a founder. Um, so, little red flags you can look out for. They are not very clear about how that money was raised. That's one thing. Secondly, then, they, you know, investors also have to be accredited, right? If, if for instance, now maybe um, it's a U.S. investor, maybe they have that U.S. money, they also, they also have to have that accreditation. Ask for it. Find out. Do that due diligence. Know where that money came from. That money they're investing you came from as well. Ask, don't be afraid to ask questions. In the same way, like, when you're looking to maybe get a job or something, you ask your employer questions, right? So you want to know the kind of company you are going to work working for. The same thing with your investors. Do your due diligence, please. All right. So I'm Michael by name, and um, my question is simply, how lucrative is investing in Nigeria is right now? This is why I believe majority of us have. Oh, uh, okay. My question is, how lucrative is investing in Nigeria is right now? This is because um, from my little research, most of the inflows we have into um, um, investment came from outside Nigeria. So they came, they are coming in in hard currency, that's dollar. Now, in a country where um, our currency is depreciating every now and then, and um, the buying power is reducing. So how lucrative is investing in Nigeria right now? Okay, so I, to be honest, I think you also, you've answered your question. But I will still make the effort to um, share how, how I, can, I can say this. Um, unfortunately, it's that political instability is hurting a lot of us, right? I've had several funds. I mean, we're looking, we're raising on behalf of some startups. And we're very happy, you know, like investors are coming in and they're like, oh, we're sorry, current political climate is not favorable. Um, we are taking our money, we are putting it in another country. I can't tell you how, how hurt I was when I saw messages like that, right? So I would say that, lucrative, I mean, lucrative, being lucrative, I can't answer, right? <laughs> I can't answer because even founders too, founders have raised money in dollars. Think about how they are also going to send the returns back. These are not always easy. That's why, you know, my, what I mentioned earlier in our presentation that not everyone is going to take VC money and that's the truth. Right, so how lucrative, I can't answer, but I can say that mm, a lot of people are thinking ahead. Right, thinking ahead. And one way is, okay, look at, we are, you see how statistics that favor us. We're, we're still the most populous black continent. We're still, I mean, population power is low, but we're still the most popular black, black continent. And we have a lot of concentration of the young people. Right, so let's just prioritize the future. And also, like, well, another thing, you know, I would also advise, um, I also advise a lot of founders, especially, you know, as they, they're growing is, and it, don't, Nigeria market is good, but it's just one market. There are other markets in Africa. There are other markets everywhere. Right? So open your eyes too. And be flexible enough to know when to expand sometimes. Or sometimes even change operations, move operations. Just be flexible. Have that as well. Those are just things you can do to arm yourself. Right, but I think that that advice will also be for people that have raised funds and they're already growing and and all. But yeah. Okay. All right. Um, okay. Sorry, just a quick last one about the female founder thing. Um, you know, what if the female is just part of your team? Doesn't have to be the co-founder. You know, what I'm saying so is that we've been in a, an accelerator program for about two years now. We're just getting to the tail end of it. And within that, you know, ecosystem, I, on the top of my head now, I know, ah, yes, there's this particular lady. I think I can get in touch with her. She can come and join us. From what you've seen in your experience and all that, you know, just for a female to be part of the team, a key member of the team, how will that drive, you know, will, will that help? 
instead of actually being the co-founder, because you might not have all the attributes to be the co-founder, but a, a key member of the team. I don't know how that will play out. How does it look like? Okay, so I'm going to reply and rephrase this in the best way that I can. Um, one of your roles as a leader is to actively invest in people. Right, you should actively invest in people. That means for some people, you may be the one giving them their first chance at life, at leadership, at big things. Maybe the ones giving them their first opportunities. Be open to that. Right, so sometimes, we're not saying that, oh, just bump them up because, um, because uh, you need a female founder on your team, but you can look for clear pathways where these people can give you more opportunities. Women can give you more opportunities, right? I mean, I've, I've personally had cases like that as, as a leader, as a founder. You see, you, you see to, um, a male female come into my organization, right? And it feels like the female is dragging and she's dragging and she's dragging. And I, I want to give up. I'm like, okay, let's just give her more opportunities. And she catches up and things are just exponential from there, right? So that's just one of your roles as a leader, to actively invest in people. Not just for tokenism efforts or just because everybody's saying, or for the optics, but actually actively invest in people. So don't just give women roles just because they are female, right? But be active in investing, okay, the people around me, how can these people grow? What's the best way? There'll be females there, there'll be ladies there, there'll be men there, right? Invest in them and let that clear pathway help you. Um, so what I wanted to say in addition to that is that um, it's not really about female founders, it's about being, having your startups being, having female leaders, having female executives, right? So you need to have competent women. So executives can be head of marketing, it can be COO, it can be CMO. Find competent women and make them leaders in your company. So, so it's not just about having a co-founder that you just give 2% or 10%. There are companies that are brutal. They want to see how many women do you have on your team. If you have a 90% male force, that's even a problem. Even if you have a female co-founder and your team is 90% men, it's a problem. Right, so it's more about how many women do you have on your team. So a a a, a VC that says um, um, I'm gender lens, could I hear that word? Um, <laughs> but um, 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 you know, I, I want to have, I want to see more gender representation on your team. They're looking for more women in your team in critical roles. If possible, female founder, but not necessarily can be female led. Now, the reason why I would say look for to the best of your ability. Now, if you cannot find, I promise you that even if you have three male co founders and you're building a great product, you will get money. People will give you money, forget. So, this is not about women, right? But if you can find good women to be executives or founders, it will help you. There are funds that are only for women. There are grants that are only for women that you can use them to go apply for. So it's, it becomes a leverage for the company. But please find competent people. Don't just, because it's obvious. I've seen decks where they will say this person head of operations. And then you, they get, she has clearly no experience. And then she comes to pitch for them. And of course, she doesn't even get it. And I know that they did that because somebody told them to use a woman, but the woman was not a competent woman. So, so try your best and find competent leaders to hire and add to your team. Before else feels, go to Access Bank and look for people. All right. Thank you, Ma. And lastly, um, I want to know <laughs> so if... Is this her question? Okay. My, my last question. What's the relationship between um, VCs now and incubators program? House, can you elaborate, please? Incubator program, like um, there's this um, like YCZ or these programs that bring out um, bring together funders and like teach them, package them, and the, those programs do get the money their money from VCs. So what's the relationship? And is it is it that um, VCs prioritize um, incubators programs more, or what's the relationship? And what's your advice now for funders? Who wants to join this incubator program? Is it advisable? Is it visible? Is it um, what's what's just your opinion about it? Okay, I think I understand your question now. You're you're asking if um, if for startups that have gone through an, an an incubator program, we have better chances with VCs, right? So think about it from this point of view, right? If you're coming to me and I see like, okay, you've had all the experience, you've learned something, you are more knowledgeable. There's a high chance that we want to look at you and prioritize you more. But it does not mean that you are not good or anything, right? So that question is going to be personal for the startup. Are you, as a startup founder, do you need that incubator program? What are the skills that you need to learn that you've not learned? 
experiences. What are the experiences you need to have that you've not had yet, right? And you feel like you need to go through the incubator program. That, that would help you. Please go ahead and do it, right? But not everyone is going to do that. And so it's not a prerequisite to get funding or, or whatnot, right? It's, it depends on you. For, for instance, some people may have, like I said, domain expertise. Maybe you've had races of 25 years. What kind of incubator program, like... You really have, you already have that knowledge, right? Or maybe you are a second time founder or things like that. So you don't have to go through that. But you as a startup founder, you know, maybe you are, maybe you are fairly new in the market. You don't have a lot of experience that much about, you know, the tech world, the technical system. And you need, you need that. Please go ahead and do it. But don't say, it's not, a, I would say it's a prerequisite, right? Although it is nice. For instance, now there are some, there are some, um, there are some accelerators you get into that it's nice, it just increases your chances of getting funded. Like your valuation just goes up high because you have entered inside that accelerator program, right? It's nice to prioritize it. It's fine. But it doesn't mean that it's a prerequisite because some, some founder startups did not go through that. Some successful startups did not go through that. But it is good to have. All right. I hope that answers your question, at least. So, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Timmy, founder of Belarus Food and Grocery Delivery App for African campuses. So I want to just make like a suggestion on the female founder topic. So I actively try, when, when we started Belarus, that's like a, about a year ago, I was trying to look for a female co-founder actively, and I didn't get, so we started them, we finally got one person, and she kind of quit like after like two months. <laughs> so we are all male right now but like um, yesterday I was thinking about this female fan and I, and I understand if you look at everybody with the camera see they are all females look at everybody there they are all like females right and even you talking the female gender and I was like I think sometimes t sometimes time will heal everything because ma male genders have been doing this thing for a very long time so we do not because like they've been doing it for a very long time so we should not just expect that okay we, didn't, we just want to like engineer like female founder into um, female like founders into the old thing, and like the analogy I have is if you look at um, She Hulk and you look at Miss Marvel, those two movies kind of flopped, and if you look at Wakanda, the it was a female lead that one didn't flop not because they were trying to put a female lead to it, it was because of the male lead something happened to him. So I was just like saying that sometimes if we allow like time to work it, it work its thing out. Like, I feel like there'll be a lot of more female founders. So, as regards, um, also, thank, thank you very much for sharing that experience. That's important. As regards, um, you know, giving um, found co founders leadership rules too early, I think there's a thread on Twitter I did. I did an entire long thread. I'm going to share it with Chigo here. You can share it with everyone. I think it's, it's good to have. I think it's just a quick inside sense of, you know, how to also better and efficiently run your startup. So, you will not have a lot of regrets later, right? All right. Thank you so much. I think that you're not taking any more questions. Thank you so much.